heavily repressed from the beginning, infiltrated and repressed. Uh, and they tried an unprecedented move to give many people kind of 25 to life. Luckily, they failed, you know, but that was how his administration started. Then there was the women's uh, uh, strike that started the day of the inauguration, you know, which was, was global in scale, actually, not just, you know, in D.C., in New York City, in San Francisco, and Los Angeles, but actually global, you know, uh, uh, in its impact. Uh, and then you had what I thought was, the, was one of the most beautiful things was once he gave those executive orders to stop travel, you know, the, the block travel from, I think it was initially nine states, uh, you know, mainly uh, Arabic speaking, predominantly Muslim states, um, how folks stood up, you know, and started showing up at JFK, uh, LaGuardia, Dulles, in many places, you know, some of it purely spontaneous, some of it, you know, organized from calls that went out. But people showing up to, to stand in defense of, uh, you know, brothers and sisters who didn't have citizenship. That was a critical milestone that happened here in the United States, which has a long track record of being extremely xenophobic, long track record. Um, that I think really, um, it's it somewhat petered out, I think because of how the initial movement, uh, got channeled into kind of an NGO, uh, uh politics, okay. you know, and, and, uh, took the, the motion out of the streets and tried to just channel it into kind of the, 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 the world of petitions, the world of, of you know, social media um, oriented campaigns. Policy instead of power. Yeah. And, and I, that kind of diffused it. And I think there, there's been just many efforts to try to stimulate that again, that have just kind of fallen short. But the, the anger you know, the frustration, the resentment that had been building throughout all those years. You know, folks have been uh, uh, the victims of, you know, uh, stupidity by Twitter for, you know, three and a half years where every day you wake up, it's some new blatantly racist, you know, statement or position or policy or something that's been announced. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I think folks just had enough of it. Um, and there's other things you, you saw this, this kind of building up, you know. Uh, one, I think, was again Bernie's campaign and some of the issues that it brought to the fore around uh, economic inequality at the very least. And I think it started to scratch the surface to, uh, on a mass level, about what was really underneath that. Um, and how that wind up being uh, prematurely cut off by liberal forces, I think was also one of those things where people saw a systemic closing the door uh, intentionally by by those who would rule us in, in the United States at any real kind of concrete solution. Right. You know, um, and you saw most of the folks starting to break out independently. But this, I think, is just, you know, the little cracks that were there, I think this is spread a, a big wedge into it. Now, the real question I think though still becomes, where does it go from here? Where do we go from here? You know, how do we sustain uh, uh, this righteous rage and turn it into a, a, cam a sustained uh, uh, campaign? One that's about transforming society, not just literally mentally tweaking it here or there, uh, but really transforming society. And that is, I think the debate which I know is starting to happen in all the little small and large places where uh, these protests have been and how these protests have, you know, the reality of how, how the dialogue has been forced. I heard some things yesterday. Um, I haven't heard, you know, really articulated to uh, an American audience uh, on mainstream TV, I would say in the United States since the probably 1992, you know, when, when with the Rodney King Rebellion, which was in Los Angeles, but not just in Los Angeles, 
And there were things that happened in Detroit and Chicago, other places in 1992. But, you know, to hear uh, uh, Ornell West and Spike Lee, you know, come on CNN and say, you know, the system cannot be reformed from within. Yeah. You know, and be able to just finally speak some real truth yeah. and not be afraid to do it. You know, because one of the things I was pointing out is this is not new to Cornell. This is not new to Spike. You know, but the the, the courage and the ability to speak it uh, because of the amount of, of pressure and the amount of clarity that's been provided by the millions of people that took to the streets. That's yeah. what's changed the dynamic. That's yeah. what opened this, this wedge up. Yeah, but but it's also a reflection of the fact that CNN allowed them to that's do right. their full say. This is, this is unusual. That's right. Uh, and I think that the, 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 both those things happening at the same time. So so how do you think that that uh, this initiative that that you've been really central to organizing uh, the people strike uh, now it, we've had one on uh, the first of May now the first of June. How, what, what are you hoping will happen today? Good question, Feroz. Good question. I think the central thing that we should be looking out for today is the, the merger of the systemic issues we've been trying to bring to the fore with the people strike and the call to move towards a general strike with the mass righteous rage that has occurred because of the resistance to American apartheid. I mean, cause that's what's really at play. That's what's being brought into question. And folks recognizing, you know, Floyd's death is directly linked to all of the black and brown folks who have died needlessly as a result of COVID-19 and how it's been managed in the United States. And that, you know, that death toll is the direct result of the systemic white supremacist nature of this society and the settler colonial foundations. And people linking those two, right? Um, and bringing more systemic energy towards a long protracted campaign of moving towards a general strike. I think that is what we are trying to bring to the fore and convincing folks that we need to use the greatest power that we have, which is control over our bodies, control over our labor, to make the situation ungovernable and untenable in the United States and to do it in an organized systemic fashion. So the hope is all the folks young and old who've really been meeting each other on the first times on the streets, you know, this last five days throughout this country, see the humanity in each other, regardless of what their age, sex, gender, race, nationality, may be, find their common interests. Because, you know, one of the things that I think, what, going back again, speaking to some of the, the new folks who've coming out, is them finding the, finding their same life interest to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I may be still a little bit ahead of you, but that's not saying much in this race. <laughs> and that we have more in common and we have a, a set of common enemies, which are totally about mortgaging our future for their profit that we have more in common if we stand together and fight back and, and build a new system through our organized, self-organized activities and building new productive relationships and new overall social relationships. I think today, June 1st, you know, as our second first strike action, in the midst of what can only be described in my view at the Floyd Rebellion, those two things, I think, coming together, uh, I hope we are able to give some sustained direction and focus, you know, in a, in a broader 
a degree of kind of uh, coherent demands that address all the particular issues that have been uncovered and brought to the fore. That's what I'm hoping happens today and that, that I think the People Strike and all the organizations that, that have endorsed it have, have taken place in one form or fashion uh, bring to the fore. And, and I think today we do that first and foremost uh, by engaging in, in, in serious conversations with each other about what's next. Because that has to be a broad, you know, uh, a democratic organization where yeah. folks are, are really debating it out, you know, but coming to terms and building the relationships that are going to be necessary to, to transform, you know, a rebellion ultimately into a revolution, because that's where we need to go. This is the first step. It's a good crack. You know, it's a beautiful fissure in the, in, in the piece, but that wall hasn't been deconstructed just yet. We got a lot of work to do to tear that down. But I think the, the, the point you make, I think, is really important one to emphasize. Uh, the, this society dehumanizes so many people. It considers anyone who's not white and part of the establishment as less than human, uh, right. whether they're women, whether they're uh, lesbian, gay, whatever, uh, trans, whatever, they, they are considered less than human. And, and I see the, these uprising now and as an assertion now that not just only that we are human, but we will demonstrate what it really means to be human. And so these solidarity actions that are happening, you know, across the is an assertion in my view that, you know, people are saying, we know what it means to be human. We're the only ones who know to, no. what it is to be human. And we will invent what it means to be human. And I think that's going to be a very central uh, message. I think that comes comes out of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's emerging. I mean, it, it, it's uneven, of course, and will we'll continue to be so for a while. You know, but it's emerging. Um, and and you, you see it in, in some of the cracks that are starting to appear within a state edifice itself. Yeah. You know, going back to the point that you made about police kneeling or the police chief, you know, uh, uh, in Minneapolis having to admit on national TV that they were complicit in, in, the, in murder, you know, the three other officers, right? Um, now, I'm not one to, to believe in overstating, you know, what the forces that comply with the state do, but we know from from history uh, that for major reform to happen, there have to be some very serious institutional cracks within the state edifice and amongst your enemies to move some things over for folks to clearly, you know, say, "Hey, this is so wrong that I actually agree with the folks that I'm I'm supposed to be repressing in this moment." Right. That ultimately winds up leading to things that we've, we've seen, which should also not be understated. You know, where there's real cracks that you were talking about, where there's real light starting to emerge. One of the most beautiful things that I've seen and, and want to bring to the fore is the transit workers refusing yeah. to comply and be complicit. Yeah. Saying, no, we are not going to, you know, work with the police, right? Because Floyd was someone we knew. Someone who, 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 you know, was in the was in the trenches with us, struggling on the day to day and in the, in the grind and hustle. We're, we're not going to comply with you treating people like this. And then that for starts spreading, right? And and for uh, uh, the trade union leadership to actually adopt that and endorse that, you know, because that's something with with the people strike we've been trying to get you know, the trade union movement to, to step out and be more in the forefront. I think this is now waking people up to a, a certain degree that we have to get involved in the struggle in some new ways. We, we've we been seeing that motion slowly creep in, right? I, I, I think, uh, um, you know, we were, were part of a, a, a spark um, to kind of kick some things off. And I think now more folks going back to the question about what we hope in this day is that many of the folks who kind of uh, thought some of our calls to move towards a general strike is being premature. Uh, I've seen a lot more uh, open conversation about that that is where we need to be headed. 
So we are encouraging all those folks who are coming to this realization to join us in, in that effort. I think that's a critical thing. But again, these cracks are starting to emerge, you know, and, and um, how they are actually, you know, transformed into a real, a real program you know, so let's imagine, you know, what, what do I mean by that? Let's imagine that the transit workers move from not just complying, you know, not just resisting this call to transport people who've been arrested. But let's say they, they move in their consciousness, start starting to think about how they can help be a security force for the mass demonstrations, how they can be a transport force for the for the mass demonstrations right. how they can provide aid and relief food and water to the mass demonstrations and ultimately how to envision public transportation under their control in a cooperative manner under solidarity principles as something that becomes a right a public right a public good so i think that that's where we need to be going so people can envision society and their ability to play a concrete role in transforming it in a totally different way, right? Instead of transportation for profit, it's transportation for human need. And, and them learning through this that, hey, our agency, in this case, with, withholding our labor and not complying, we can also assert a different type of agency of transformation and doing something different with the tools that other workers have created and utilized, and that we can do that together to serve some broad human needs to raise some serious questions and issues. Like these are things I think are beginning to be in, in, in the forefront of people's minds about that there can be a different way that all of this can be organized along <laughs> rational uh, 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 means to produce radically different outcomes for, for everybody in this country. I mean, I think that's a really important point and I, and, and I you know, I think it's really important what what you've made happen in terms of a, of, of a, a, a day of action today uh, in, in relation to it, because I think there is a need for for forums where people can discuss these ideas, because I think with as they emerge, uh, I have great faith in the ability of people to be creative and come up with new ways of organizing, new ways of of uh, taking over and I, I hope that one of the outcomes will be the formation of these kind of uh, people's councils where where that discussion can take place. Uh, do you see that something that will emerge? I think so. I think so. I mean I can tell you in a couple of places it's already emerging. You know we're, we're a, a, a good number of the leadership of folks who've, who've taken to the streets um, you know, these past four or five days uh, has come from different forces that are related to the people's strike. And it brought, you know, the, this call, this demand, uh, and brought it to the fore in places like, you know, Detroit, Chicago, New York City, you know, here in, here in uh, uh, Jackson, New Orleans, uh, and the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, so uh, people seeing the, the links and the links being made and the conversations being had, that is actually going on on the streets. And all the reports that I'm getting, you know, folks are, are raising that question, what's next? What do we do? Where do we go? You know, uh, and and it's a, it's a combination of the build and fight that we've been trying to articulate, you know, stopping the state and stopping the forces of capital from controlling and dictating our lives, but having a deeper conversation with each other about we have power to not only, you know, shape what happens today, we have power to shape what happens in the future through our collective efforts and solidarity and labor. Like that, so that's beginning to happen. It's gotta be amplified. And that's the point of, you know, this broadcast and others, uh, it's gotta be amplified. So we have a much deeper conversation and we're pushing each other in constructive ways. You know, well, what about this? You know, what about that? Uh, so that we come up with collective solutions to the issues because not no one of us has a solution to the magnitude and the depth of, of in the complexity of life in this society. Right. Uh, it's it's going to have to be a collective way, but 
how do we engage in the broad democratic decision making and broad democratic dialogue to get us there? Uh, this is this is the cooking pot to do it. You know, this is the arena to do it. Um, so, I mean, uh, 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 we have to elevate it and I think be out there to the greatest extent possible, uh, continue to push this in all the forums and all the debates. You know, because there's some things we also got to, to be on the, mind, on the lookout for. You know, one of the things that we need to be very much forewarned about uh, is folks trying to channel all of this into the Democratic Party or folks trying to channel all of this into, you know, kind of NGO structures and, and take people off of the streets, you know, uh, and instead of saying that the dialogue really ultimately has to happen with the greatest extent of, of you know, human contact and engagement, you know, which, you know, this is fine for what it is, me and you talking in this medium and being able to share across borders, but there's no real substitute for sitting down and consistently dialoguing and breaking bread with each other. You know, that that still has to happen in all of the large, mid-sized, small towns everywhere where people are coming together. So we shouldn't be taking people down the streets. We should be encouraged people to be more in the streets. Now, mindful, we got to do it uh, in, under these terms, you know, with, with practicing <laughs> appropriate physical distancing. You know, so one of the things that, that uh, honestly, I have been worried about, like seeing the beauty of what's going on, but there's the other part of me, which is also cringed by, you know, it, it, I expect to see an upsurge in cases, unfortunately, in about two weeks. Well, that, that may well be. Uh, but the reality is the condition that many people are living under doesn't actually allow them to have uh, a social distancing. So, you know, right. Uh, right. We bear that in, in, in mind anyway. Um, uh, don't go away. Uh, we, 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 um, one of the important things about this is that, is, is, is that uh, the impact of what has been going on on the streets these last couple of days has not been confined to the United States of America. In Montreal this morning there were major demonstrations uh, taking place uh, and of course the agents provocateurs were there as well. So there was a lot of uh, tear gas and fights against uh, against the demonstration. Uh, and um, I've just received a message from uh, from uh, Nimo Basi in Nigeria, who is uh, one of the leading people in uh, in uh, on the issue of environment. He's a chair. Or he's the organizer of uh, um, the. Uh, uh, Health of Mother Earth Foundation. If I can just quickly play his short message, which he just sent sent over, um, see if I can share the screen. Oh, good, good. Uh, and um, uh, here's here's Nimo. Uh, if I can get him to to speak. Oh dear, where has he gone? Uh, um, uh, come on, Nimo. <laughs> Uh, I thought I, I had him a, a, a moment ago. Um, let me I see him through. down there. I saw his name when you put yeah, it up there. Yeah, no, let me just uh, see if I can uh, get him back on here. Uh, Nimo, Nimo, Nimo. Uh, here you go. Uh, the start that again when sorry about was. this uh but uh um i am going to try and uh uh share the screen uh there uh so let me share that we should yep and uh when the murderous policemen the media police took the breath away from michael floyd they choked the entire world and today we stand in solidarity against hatred, against slavery, against colonialism, against imperialism, against everything that denies the right of citizens of this world to breathe. There. Uh, that's Nimo Basi, all the way from Nigeria, who said, look, you know, I need to get a message across 
of solidarity because we have to shelter hope. Yeah? Uh, and I think that's uh, an important one. We have another one from shack dwellers in, in Nairobi. <laughs> uh, again, uh, hey, let's put it out there. Get that voice out there. Yeah, uh, let me see if I get them on, on uh, their, their message up as well. Um, yeah, uh, we'll be there in just a moment. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, here goes. Um, okay. Uh, standing in front of a, of a picture of, uh, of Thomas Sankara. Okay. Uh, there we are. Messages coming from around the world. We will keep bringing those those in uh, from time to time. Uh, Kali, um, I think we are expecting a, a, another uh, guest in, um, so you are welcome to stay on or uh, uh, or leave, depending on your schedule. And we have uh, Rose Brewer come in to. Okay, great. Join us. Well, let's bring Rose up. I'll transition uh, out uh, and Rose, tune in Rose, Rose. and start doing my part to, to, to spread the word. Hey, Rose, how you doing? Uh, you're you're on mute, Rose. We got to take you off mute. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah, how are both of you? How are you? Doing good. Yeah, uh, a little fuzzy. Long, another long night. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke clear yet this morning? Yeah, they got us occupied. You know that, don't you? Yeah, I saw the saw the tanks rolling down the street and then pointing yep, 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 uh, yep. Uh, guns at folks sitting on the porch and standing in the, in, on the at the doorstep. That's right. That's 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 the way it is right now. Um, you know, um, right after Mike Brown happened, um, everywhere everyone was saying that it's just a matter of a matter of time before it was going to explode here, but because the conditions were very similar. And that was what, going on six years ago in August. Yeah. So this is what it took. Uh, and there were protests at that time and the takeover of the fourth precinct over on the north side by some young black activists. And they occupied that precinct space. They didn't burn it down, but they closed it down. And so we're seeing the reverberations of a lot of that. Plus the history, as you all know, is, is much deeper and longer. Uh, this is a capitalist city with corporations everywhere, some of the leading corporations in the country. And um, this has meant a particular kind of white supremacist racial capitalist dynamic uh, under the veneer of liberalism. And I know, uh, Kali, you've been here, so you know that of veneer. So all of those dynamics are at play in this context and a relatively small Black population. Uh, so the bonding around whiteness is very deep. Uh, that psychosocial dynamic. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know what y'all, what else y'all want to put on the table, but there's, uh, we're going to be talking about some of that a little bit later, right? Sure, we will be. But but just give me some sort of impressions of, of what are you seeing in terms of hope building of of change emerging of cracks in the in the body politic yeah i think this is a, a rupture uh, a rupture that was probably to some extent uh in not in the game plan that uh, the powers that be uh had um it can go in more than one direction you know as i said we're under occupation and, uh, you know, that signals a, a deeper move to repression, to containment, and who are the power elites listening to, uh, the, the white 
refrain to tamp down, we want our comfort zone, this is making us uncomfortable, or the righteous voices of the people who led uh, the uprising. And so can there be a power shift uh, under national conditions that are um, right, right leaning? Uh, leaning? Um, the hope is uh, that we now have a cadre of younger people who have, they started their chops with, with Ferguson. Um, they uh, got consciousness around that and they took over the fourth precinct. And now they have some experience under their belt on how to negotiate uh, some of this. So there are gonna be some shifts, whether they're dynamic enough to deal with all of the, the dispossession. You know, I'm not naive to think that, but something's going to give. And there is a new, very young uh, set of, of uh, revolutionaries, if you will, who can be brought into the fold. Uh, so that infrastructure, that resistive infrastructure is stronger, uh, I believe, than it was. Again, where that goes, uh, when you think about what we're up against, uh, I don't think that's completely decided. It's gonna be up to us uh, to really push that. Uh, but there are, there are glimmers of, of hope there. Right. Um one of the things we saw at, with the with the outbreak of COVID was the armed right wing, the, the political base of Trump, uh, organizing uh, and, and terrifying to see the, the kind of arms that they have. Do you see this as a factor playing in uh, in the coming period? For sure, certainly. Um, if you remember, uh, actually, in the twenty sixteen election leading up to uh, Trump's uh, election. This state actually was only about 4,000 votes short in terms of support. So that goes back to how liberal, in fact, the state is. And he's been playing that off uh, pretty directly in recent time. Uh, we have a uh, history going back to the police. The police uh, founded deeply on uh, the dispossession of native lands here. We're on Dakota lands, uh, the genocide and the removal of the Dakota people and other indigenous folk. And uh, there was always, at least by the turn of the century, uh, 1922 or so, there was an active clan presence in the police department founded on that, that core of folk. And that's been one of the refrains since in the past hundred years that uh, there's a deep infusion of white supremacism in the Minneapolis and St. Paul departments. Of course, in the wake of the shooting of uh, Jamar Clark uh, and others, um, there's a black police chief, uh, but there's also a black, uh, a white police union that is infused with those tendencies. And you have to ask who's in control here, <laughs> you know? Yes. The, 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 one of the main slogans being pushed out at the moment is defund the police. Uh, uh, how's that taking hold in terms of people's consciousness and people's aspirations? I think it's taking hold. I think, uh, especially with young activists, is something that shifts the conversation from the community control of police to this idea of divest, invest, reinvest in uh, resources for the people. Uh, obviously that's a tactical move from my perspective and uh, it's not sufficient in and of itself, but it has catalyzed and, and mobilized folk. And there is quite a bit of organizing around it. Um, and I think it's through that lens, some of the shifts will probably happen. Okay, we have um, uh, Fern Shivers uh, coming in uh, now. Uh, hey, hey. I see. Uh, let me just uh, turn the uh, unmute. 
I'm gonna hop off everybody and, and help hey, spread the word. Joining us, Kelly. And get ready for the action here in Jackson. Uh, good seeing everybody. Thanks, and, and I'll tune in and let folks know. All right. All right.